Welcome to Choices for Women. I'm your host, Nancy Muller, and we're doing something a little bit different today. We are doing video along with this podcast. And I know I've done live video in the past, but this one is going to be a little bit different. My featured guest today is Manu Toigo. And we are going to party like purple with her today. And actually, I'm wearing my, my party like purple t-shirt too, Manu. I want you to know this. Um, so... I am really excited to share her with the audience today, and she was actually a guest of mine in the past. Um, the reason that we've decided to do this, to do another podcast and another interview with Manu is because if you haven't heard, she's recently just starred in a National Geographic series called Migration, and that's M-Y-Gration, not M-I-Gration. And um, Manu... Ah, first, before we go anywhere, I'm just going to say, Manu, welcome to Choices for Women. Thank you very much, Mir. Uh, this, is, this is another great opportunity, of course, and as always, sharing experiences like these, um, it, it, it inspires people and it teaches people to be able to challenge themselves or, or see deeper into a journey that they embark on and not be afraid of where that journey is going to take them. It's for the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, you've been on Choices for Women before. And um, however, that was as you were coming off of um, National or, or off of uh, Discovery's Naked and Afraid. So yes. a lot of people know you as, um, you know, the Naked and Afraid woman. Although, as I've said many, many times, Manu, I, I don't see you being afraid of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, no. I'm really excited to get to share you and your story again with the audience because, um, you know, ever since the first time we met, the first time that I interviewed interviewed you you and I have become fast friends and it was like zip you live where I live here we're going to get together and you and I have been motivating empowering and inspiring each other ever since and audiences you've been a guest in some of the workshops that I've done um, you're just you're just a testimony to what women can do and again I'm just really really excited to have you here today thank you Thank you. It's all about empowering women. No Absolutely. matter how old we are, that's the whole point. It doesn't matter how old you are. Absolutely. We continue to empower ourselves in what we do best. So, Manu, before we go any farther, for people that are listeners or people that will be watching this video that are not familiar with you and your work, can you tell the listeners and the people watching this video who you are, what you do, and why you're so fabulous. <laughs> um, well, obviously my name is Manu, and uh, it's becoming a household name, slowly but surely. And, and the reason being, it, it started several years ago, first doing the, the very first primitive survival show called I Caveman on Discovery. And from that, that's when I got this um, ease and confidence and, and this reconnection with how I grew up or what I had learned from when I was a child growing up in a rural area. And be like, my goodness, I had forgotten about how this makes me feel and, and how natural it came to me. So that was an amazing step into starting to be known into in the survival world. Then, uh, of course, Naked and Afraid started, and uh, I was approached or told by someone that I should definitely look into it and I would be definitely suitable to do something like that. And so I did my little research and I went, oh, yeah, of course I can do this. 21 days, oh, that's nothing, you know. So, I mean, Naked and Afraid was really, truly incredible. It was so challenging. And it was very difficult. There were so many things that we had to overcome and persevere through on all levels. Mm -hmm. Dehydration, hunger, the environment, 
all of that impacted you, impacted us uh, physically, emotionally, and psychologically. And and when when you do these kind of things too, you also have to accept that there are certain uh, certain things that could happen. There are dangers that could happen while you're doing something like this. Nothing is ever super safe. And, and as we have learned oh, from Naked and Afraid, I was bit by the mosquito. I contracted hemorrhagic dengue fever. And, and that kind of put me on a whole different path on how to survive something as severe and life-threatening as hemorrhagic dengue fever. I learned a lot by doing Naked and Afraid as to what I was capable of and how much I could take, my body physically could take. And it made me understand a lot more about myself, but it also gave me oh, the strength and the mindset to say, my goodness, if I can do this and if I can overcome this, anything that's ahead of me, I can also do. I can face it and know that I'll be okay. And despite the fact that I got very sick and had to overcome that, it made me, uh, I mean, it really did put a damper in, in my lifestyle because it took oh, probably about nine months, ten months for me to basically fully recover to a point where I was able to physically go back to work. And that there was very challenging. And, and it did set me back a great deal on, on many levels. Now, <laughs> to this day, I still get people asking me, you know, who have seen the repeats of this show, they still, they're still thinking that I'm trying to recover from this. But, let, you know, needless do they know, I've already gone and done another epic, amazing challenge. You of, have. Of a lifetime. Yeah. And I had some people um, talk to me about, you know, well, why would you want to do something again like that? You know, why you almost, you almost died from naked and afraid. Aren't you afraid that, that you're not going to be able to do it? Or aren't you afraid of, of something else happening? It's like, absolutely not. You can't allow a fear from the past to stop you from keeping to move forward. You know, and Manu, I think that's really experience. And I think that's really important that you said that because I remember you and I even had the conversation and, and I was being selfish. I said, Manu, I don't want you to go. I, I want to make sure that, you know, you're going to be in my life forever and ever and ever. And, you know, you, you, said, you yeah. said, Nancy, this is something that I have to do. This is, this is such a great uh, opportunity for me. And I supported you because I love you so much and I really – I, I support what you do and I support what you represent, but I know that a lot of times when people are, are worried about, you know, why do you do this? It's more because we selfishly want to make sure that you're going to be here for us. Mm. And I think that that's um, something that needs to be thought about when, you know, someone is wanting to do something really important in their life that, that they feel is important and others are trying to keep them from doing it. Right, and, and you're you're right about that. And by by doing this migration challenge in in Tanzania, Africa, and we'll we'll go into exactly what that was. Um, it was more about perhaps even proving to myself that despite of what happened through naked and afraid and recovering from that nasty nasty illness. I built myself the confidence again to, to say, like, I am going to prove to myself that I can still do this and I'm not going to be afraid of what's happened to stop me from continuing to do something that I'm very, very passionate about. You, you really are a testimonial to that you walk the, your talk because I can remember when you were covering, when you were recovering from the dengue fever that um, 
it was a scary time. It was a very scary time. And, you know, you, you really had to be sure that everything was where it needed to be before you pushed yourself once again to do something else. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that, oh, it's not what you think. You got cameramen there. But, you know, maybe you want to share with people. The cameramen are there to record what's going on. They're not there to bring you, you know, sandwiches and no. iced tea. <laughs> no. Well, I, I will say that the, the two shows side by side were, were very, very different on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. You know, both participant-wise and crew wise naked and afraid it was a very small crew it was just one cameraman one sound guy and one other person and then that's it and they were only there for a part of the day for the most part on naked and afraid you're completely left alone to fend for yourself um the show that i did for national geographic and uh that and the pr premise of that show uh, called migrations, migrations, was really to to test uh, if if humans actually could could follow the migration of the wildebeest through the Serengeti, from the south of the Serengeti to the north of the Serengeti to the Mara River. They crossed the Mara River into Kenya, and that's where all the grass and and it's basically following the rain. And that's why they do that migration. They do all their carving in, in uh, February and March. And those calves, as soon as they're born, they are fit to survive, like, instantly. I mean, it's incredible. The herds that we saw, once we actually caught up with the migration of the wildebeest, you see these, like, newborn calves, and they're already staying up with the rest of the herd. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, it was an amazing example of what true survival of the wilderness is. If, you know, I have to, and I have to say that, you know, my mom watched every single week of migrations yeah. and, you know, her and I would talk and she'd say, Nancy, I'm so worried about Manu. And I said, mom, you know, she's home safe. I told you she's home safe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She had to keep telling <laughs> herself every week, you know, that you made it home safe. Because yeah. it, it was really harrowing. And I know when you and I talked when you got back that um, you said this was the most challenging thing you'd ever done. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was. And the reason why it became most challenging was, okay, naked and afraid, we're putting into, we are put into areas where we are, allowed to forage and hunt right yeah. and most of the areas that we are placed in have lots of water sources mm -hmm. so there's no concerns about that the real concerns is like whether or not you can hunt and forage and know what to hunt and what to forage and what to eat right so the, you know naked and afraid you really had to have like the skills to be able to understand what's available in the immediate area, the resources, just in that area. And you're not moving anywhere necessarily. You walk into the location, you stay, and then you move out of location to go to where the extraction point is. What migrations was, because we were trekking through the Serengeti National Park, we could not forage and we could not hunt and the only water sources that we came across basically were those animal holes yeah where all the wildebeest and zebra and, and lions hyenas everything they all come into that water hole and that's where they drink that's where they feast and kill you, you know the predators kill for that for that area and there were rivers that we did come across, but those rivers aren't there <laughs> to, to swim in because you have dangers of, of the, the massive Nile crocs there and, and also the risk of hippos a, as well. I mean, it's just so much more deadlier. Mm -hmm. there, there was so much more that you had to like, okay, so we can't 
campfire. We can't go swimming in the river. There weren't too many rivers that we crossed. And basically our only water sources were water holes that were just mud pools. I mean, it was probably the nastiest water I have ever tasted in my life. But when it comes to survival, that's it. You just have to go with what's available. So, and I know that you told me that um, your only food source was what you carried in a small uh, pack on your back. Not even a pack. It was a blanket that you made yeah. into a pack. I I exactly. So in the beginning of the track, uh, the trek, um, there was a pile of food, or you know, not not good food. I mean, good not good food, if you know what I mean. Yeah, gourmet. Let's right. put it that way. Right. And and it was um, the food that we carried was the honey that that uh, a certain group went out with the Hadzaba Hadzabi tribe. Mm -hmm. to go and forage for honey to fill up containers. I went out with the women to go and forage for tubers, which was really incredible. And I have to say, I have to bring this up because I think this is really important. And this shows the, the different levels of, of how we understand humanity and how we bring up our children. Because there in the Hadzabi tribe, Little ones, not even two-year-olds, are already walking barefoot and with their parents to go digging for tubers and things like that. And they're, they're digging in the ground with sticks and they're handling knives very comfortably. So tell us what a tuber is. A, a, a tuber is a, um, a, a underground, kind of like a sweet potato or, or so, you know, like that. A tuber is, is something okay. that grows underneath ground. Phew, I thought it was like a bug. No, 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 no. Okay. So basically you identify it by a vine near a tree and you can tap the ground with the stick until you hear like a hollow, right? It's like, okay, there's the vine. I can hear the hollow and you start digging. Okay. And then in there you can bring up like these massive tubers. Now what's important about those tubers, they're a source of um, uh, um, nutrients, mm -hmm. but also a, a source of, um, water as well because they're water they, they saturate water so it was important for us to have that uh -huh. and um, they we had also gotten um, baobab tree seed which is like a, a hard seed which is very difficult to open up in the first place then you crack it open and then there's all these multiple seeds now in that is a white powder which is full of electrolytes and other vitamins. And the Hadzabi tribe actually forage these a lot because it actually helps keep them well, keeps sicknesses away. I remember so, you shared some with me when you got back, and yeah. it was amazing. Yeah, it's very, very sweet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Very sweet. Delicious, too. But, but, but the thought of, I mean, like, yeah, it's good, but the thought of living on that for how, how many days were you out there? Uh, I think we were out there about just over five weeks. But but the thing is, we went in one spot for five yeah. weeks. We had to travel on foot, and I think we covered about 250-plus miles on foot. Amazing. Only with one set of clothing. That's it. Yeah. So you can imagine what we stink like after, <laughs> <laughs> after we finished it all. But, uh, you know, you get used to that <laughs> eventually. Everyone smells the same. So we just like, oh, all right, you all stink. Let's all, you know. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. And we were given um, uh, um, Maasai blankets, which gave us, um, you know, obviously a blanket to keep ourselves warm of a night. But we also used it to carry our supplies, mm -hmm. like our food supplies and, and, and things like that. Um, and those water holes, we were given jerry cans. So when we came across a water hole, that was the only way. There's no way that, that, that we could travel from one water hole to another on no water because they were massively far apart. And when you're walking and using so, like a lot of physical exhaustion, um, 
how many times we were all dehydrated. I've lost count of. I mean, it was a constant worry throughout the entire trek. And what were the temperatures like? Uh, on the lower grounds, it was extremely hot. Um, if you can imagine, probably in the 90s or the 100s. When we got to higher elevation, the days were really nice, still hot, but overnight it got very cold. Uh -huh. and, and you only had a blanket to cover up with. We had just that one thin blanket to cover what? up with. But I'll say that that material there, um, the material that they use there is, is, is very effective. It's very strong, durable. I um, found out that if you wet the blanket, mm -hmm. right, and you wrap it around yourself, it actually acts like a bit of an air cooler. So it actually cools down your body. And then, of course, dry on, on cold air, it actually keeps your body warm thin. I remember you said you even used it at your house in L.A. Yeah. Um, when I visited, you said, um, yes, now I wet this blanket. It was really hot last night. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, because what do we all think of here in civilization? We think of air conditioning and turn on the fan and all of that. And right. you just complete, you all, you never cease to amaze me. You're always coming up with these ideas about how well, to do it so simply. Where I grew up, you know, the, our temperatures can soar into the hundreds. And share, yeah. share and, where you grew up because that's important. Yeah. Yeah, well, oh, in far north Queensland of Australia, it's tropical. It's very humid and very hot. And I grew up, we didn't have air conditioning or fans in the room or anything like that. So even when we were kids, we would wet towels, put it down on the bed. So we would just sleep on a wet towel and we would wet a sheet or another towel and put it over us. That's, that's how I learned to keep cool overnight doesn't doesn't get cold enough <laughs> to, to actually have blankets or coats or anything like that. But, I mean, we're almost right there at the equator. So, I mean, that was something that I already understood from, you know, by using a blanket as a cooling system. Um, I, I'd already known that from when I was a child, you know, growing up. Um, I mean, there was, you know, it's just the same... You know, with a lot of the things that I discover what I can use, do, it's multitasking, like, the little things. A certain object is, okay, a nail file. It's like everyone says, oh, it's a nail file, but it's only for nails. What else can you use this for? Mm -hmm. Right? You could sharpen it up, make a point. Right, so you could actually use it as a weapon, maybe, or whatever. You could also use it to file down calluses and things like that. You can also use it to to help strike a bit of a fire, depending on what kind of a nail file that you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're doing is you whatever you have or whatever resource that you have, you are trying to find a way to use it in multiple ways. You're like the female version of MacGyver. I mean, you just, you come up with all of these amazing things that you do. You, you just amaze me. Yeah. I mean, and I'm going to, I want to go back though to, um, what in being a girl, I think I can ask this question. What prompted you to be in the survival Mm, genre that you're in I mean what pushes a woman to say um, this is what I'm gonna do I hear you have a lot of sirens out there in LA you know yeah in LA. I'm, I'm only an hour and a half from you <laughs> but um, what pushes a woman to want to be a survivalist I mean as opposed to wow, I really roughed it here in my childhood and now I've come out of it on the other side and now I'm going to sit by the pool and eat bonbons. I mean, what prompted you to stay in that, in that genre? Reconnecting. Reconnecting with nature. Reconnecting with the wilderness. Reconnecting with common sense if God has given you that gift. Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of common sense. And so, 
you know, when I see people around me that have experienced uh, growing up on a farm or a rural area or not having really experienced what it's like to be in the wilderness or what it feels like to be without water or, or, or little water or little food and, and things like that. It's, it, 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 it's like um, you're not doing yourself a favor by being completely dependent on modern technology and resources. Yes, and I've heard you say that many times, yeah. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And so, you know, as the common phrase that is now used worldwide and here in America specifically is when shit hits the fan, right? So what are we going to do or what are most people going to do when shit hits the fan? A lot of them have absolutely no clue. I know. I said last time that I was going to come and be by you, and you said, I'm going to be gone. <laughs> I will already be gone. A lot of people say, oh, we're going to find you. I'm like, yeah, but you better be here within five, ten minutes because yeah, I'm, already be on, I'm already gone. Right. Right? And, and the reason being is, is like a lot of people, and we've seen this in history. We've seen this even in recent history. And I'm going to uh, particularly say, like, the, the uh, Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. Let's reflect as to what happened in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a bad cyclone, right? right? And it caused an absolute catastrophe. But not only because of the flooding and, and the fact that it wiped out an entire, you know, town and, and all that kind of stuff. Right but it put people into panic mode. Right, it did. When people go into panic mode, that's when all the crazy comes out and people do not know how to react to that. And they become more violent, they become looters, and, and it becomes the wrong way to mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. So in any situation, even a first date of a snake bite, a car accident, a fire, uh, anything of the sort, the key thing is, is to remain calm. And I know sometimes a lot of it, it can't be helped. And the reason being is because they haven't allowed themselves to have these experiences. Mm -hmm. right? Well, no one, no one wants to have. Safe. They all right. want to remain safe. No one wants to have a traumatic experience to know what to do when you have a traumatic experience. No, of course but not. I know that you are doing a great job of helping uh, youth understand how to be prepared. In your, uh, you have camps for kids, and you're teaching them how to find water, basic first aid. You're, yes. you're doing so many awesome things for the ki some of the kids in L.A. near Griffith Park that you're really – you're teaching them how to survive, even though they might not ever have to use it, but you are, you're teaching them that they have it. You've got it in you. And it's kind of like when you learn self-defense, you hope that you'll never have to use it, but right. you've got the knowledge if you do. Well, it, absolutely. And I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, I love teaching the basic survival skills to young kids. Because already it's starting to have their minds think about certain scenarios and situations. When I do teach these survival classes to the kids, I add in a scenario, mm -hmm. right? Or a couple of various scenarios so that they can see where it all can be related, mm -hmm. both in the wilderness and within their own home. How to first aid, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing treating first aid out in the wilderness, but how many kids really know how to treat themselves in the home? 
Right. If something was to happen. But as a lot of kids, they go to their parents screaming, yelling, whatever, ah, you know, going all crazy. And then it's the parents that have to try and calm them down and things like that. If they are taught the basics of it and the key thing is remaining calm, right? Mm -hmm. Remaining calm. You can overcome a lot of things. And when you do remain calm, if you are scared and you have too much fear in you, your peripheral vision and your thinking goes from here into tunnel vision. Mm Mm-hmm. And you cannot, you can't react appropriately. Therefore, it's actually endangering yourself. And that's why a lot of, when accidents or like bad accidents happen, a lot of people end up dying because the fear has overwhelmed them. Now, Manu, I know that you face things like waking up to a snake between your legs yeah. Not just any snake, but the most deadliest snake in, in Australia. I know you've been chased by crocodiles in the water. So just one crocodile. <laughs> okay, by a crocodile. It's more crocodiles than I want to be chased by. But how do you how would you share with someone to not let that fear grab a hold of you? I mean, I know that because I've heard the story before that when you knew that that snake was just doing what snakes do, trying to keep warm and it curled up around you, that you had to wait hours until people woke up so that you could tell them what was going on. Yeah. Where do you think this calmness comes in for you? It has, it has to come from the way I grew up and using common sense. I mean, right from a little kid, we had to learn about common sense, using your head, you know? Right. And um, so some people just don't have it. That's the reality of it. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, that's a fact. But, but I think you can definitely learn how to control your fear mm-hmm. and learn to remain calm if you continuously open the conversation with yourself. And, you know, we're talking about survival, like in the wilderness or survival, I don't know, when a crocodile's coming after you. But I've heard you speak to women's groups, and I've watched them hanging on every single word that you say when you talk about fear and letting fear go. Because there's, there are so many women who are letting or allowing fear to keep them from what they want to do in their everyday life. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, a- absolutely. It's not just women. It's, it's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And um, with women, from my own personal experience, of course, not just wilderness, we're talking about really private experiences, things that should never, ever have to happen to women. Right. Right. And when something as traumatic as that happens to someone, it's very hard to see over the wall, to see the light, to be able to climb up over that brick wall and to continue on and leave it behind. And I have to admit, it did take me some time myself to learn that because it was traumatic, Mm -hmm. right? Right. But... I think the first thing that I had to let go of was the anger and the self-pity. And that was the first step. Mm -hmm. Yes, I recognized I was a victim because that's what I kept on being told by everyone. You're a victim. You're a victim. You're a victim. And you hear that so much from the nurses, from the hospital, doctors, your, your, your friends, you know, your family or whatever, that you start believing yourself like, oh, I was a victim, I was a victim, I was a victim. If you keep repeating that in your own mind, you're going to start believing that you are the victim. Right. And that's where you'll always stay as the victim because people constantly say, oh, I'm sorry, you were a victim of this or a victim of that. Right. Right. I moved past that 
And now I can talk about it saying like, yeah, that happened to me, but it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. And, and I now see it as something that is valuable. It was a valuable lesson. And for whatever reason it happened, we could all say, oh, it happened for a reason. You know, sometimes those reasons just like whatever. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but if you can at least look back at it, not as the victim, as the observer. Mm -hmm. And we do remember the detailed things that happened, right, on any situation, even right. a car, right? A car right. You, you, you remember. And the reason why you remember is because when your body goes into shock or tra trauma or fear, everything slows down. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Time is actually occurring normally. Right. The mind has like pushed back and it's like this big warp, like, oh, we're in slow motion now. Right. And the reason why that happens is because it's actually giving us that opportunity to think and plan, to observe, make the next move, got to do this, have to do that, this is what I can do, that kind of thing. It's a fight for survival. That's why that happens to you. Right. Right? So when you reflect on something that's happened in the past, you do remember those details. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. And then you just learn from it. And then you see the positive in it. Mm -hmm. That's what I love. It's one of the things that I am so fond of talking about. When you can give yourself permission to step out of victim mode. Right. And look at the, the event as far as what did I learn from that? Um, whatever I learned from that, what can I take with me going forward? Yes. From happening again. Yes. And you start to see that you have choices. You can choose to look at yourself as a victim. You can choose to see yourself as someone who has been through an event and you've come out on the other side and now ask yourself, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that experience? How are you going to take that experience and move forward on your journey in life? Because we all have a choice, right? We can stay there and we can be mired in the self-pity and the victim mode, or we can say, okay, enough is enough. I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to let go of victim mentality, victim mode, and I'm ready to rise above. I'm ready to get on the other side of this. And yeah. then, you know, when you can go on and empower others based on your experience, now we are lifting up so many people and it's great and you are then now discussing to people that you are talking to instead of stating there standing there like i was a victim of this and this happened to me and you know you're almost like asking for pity from other people you're right. inviting other people like oh i'm sorry that had to happen to you and everything like that but if you step forward in a positive and empowered manner saying I was a victim of this and and as soon as someone says oh I'm so sorry it's like no there's no need to be sorry mm -hmm. it was something that that happened to me that may have had to happen for me right so I can learn something very powerful from it move forward and be able to share with others so that there's a familiar uh, a familiarity of it, mm -hmm. and then you empower each other. Exactly, and I, as I said, you're helping yeah. each other move forward. Right, and I've heard you speaking to women's groups. You and I did a workshop not too long ago where the women in the audience were hanging on your every word, and yeah. some of them were going through challenges of their own. And they were taking the strength that you were sharing, the strength mm -hmm. that you were putting out there, and they were grabbing a hold of that. And every single woman who rises above, who lets go of victim mentality, who rises above and says, I will not let that define me. I will not let that event 
define who I am at this moment and going forward. We then raise the vibrational energy for women everywhere to say, okay, who can I team up with? Who can I find? Who can I share my story with? And it's, it's like I'm always saying, you know, speak your truth, even if your voice shakes. And when you speak your truth, I remember the very first time I said out loud, this happened. And then I waited and I'm like, oh, the ground didn't open up and swallow me. <laughs> and actually it felt quite good to finally have that out of here. And so then I kept going and I kept going and I kept going. And I know this is what you've done. Yeah. And, and I love because, you know, when you and I have been out and people recognize who you are and they come up to you and they're talking to you and, you know, they just, they want a piece of that strength from you. I see it. When I, when, when that happened to me and we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, 18 or 20 I would say 18 years ago now or 19 years ago, somewhere in there, it still feels like it just happened. Absolutely. It, just, it does. Right. Because it was pretty powerful. Um, and uh, it was, <clears throat> it took so much out of me. It, 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 it took everything that I believed as to who I was out of me. It took the strong girl that I was away from me. Mm -hmm. And I was walking around in zombie land, trying to figure out who I was. Why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? Why me? Why did it happen? What is it preparing me for? So I had all these questions, but I wasn't quieting myself to listen to the answers. Right to look for the answers and then finally hear them. Mm -hmm. But once, once I broke through that and that's not an easy challenge, I'm not saying, Oh, it's going to happen overnight. It never does. Right. But if you have a strong community around you, strong women around you, like voices like yourself and mine, right. We can then help each other to get through this. When we get through it, we find a particular strength and identity of ourselves that will make us unstoppable. Hence, that's why I started doing these survival things. Right. Even in my 40s, I started late. I've been doing it since I was a kid, but I was very dormant for a long time because of situations. Mm hmm and I allowed those situations to hold me back. But I watch you, Manu. I walk out of it. Right. And I watch you, though. And when you're teaching, when you're teaching your survival, when you're talking about it, when you're talking about the shows that you've been on, you, you are teaching at the same time. You are encouraging. You are uplifting. And this is something that the event that you're talking about did not rob from you. And I love that you did not let that event define who you are today. You've moved through it. And while none of us will forget the traumas and events that have happened that have been traumatic, let's just say traumatic yeah. in our lives, yeah. that we feel that we're never going to recover from or that we feel we're going to be marked for the rest of our lives like as that woman that happened to her. Right. Sometimes those can be really challenging to let go of because we feel that we are known by that thing that happened. And again, Manu, I'm just really, I, I honor you so much for what you do and how you, you just keep pushing ahead and you just keep making the impossible possible. And I, I, I love your, your zest for that and, and how just going for a walk with you, you find things that, things just amaze you. And, and you have this, this unquenchable thirst for, I wonder what's over that hill or I wonder what's under that rock. And <laughs> you don't let the fear of what could be over that hill or under that rock 
No, I'm Ooh. inquisitive. It's 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 like um, not not leaving any rock unturned. There you go. Let's see what we can discover. Let's see what we find. Let's see what we can learn from it. It's like when I go out hiking, I'm always always picking at things, picking up things, crushing them, smelling them. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What can this be used for? What could this be used for? Oh, I know what this could be used for. No, I don't really not even know what that plant is or that leaf was or whatever it is. I'm curious. I want to know whether or not it can help me in in a way. You know what I mean? In a situation. Right. And you know what else, Manu, that I really take from what you share with women um, is that the fact that people can look at you and see this survivalist, this person who is able to go into the wildest wilds of Africa or, you know, in the jungle and survive and survive dengue fever, hemorrhagic dengue fever, of which there's no cure. And no. you come back from these, from these events and these traumas you don't say why me why me instead you push forward mm. and you show people that um please don't let an event that happened in your past keep you from living in the present and for that you know i just i honor you so much for the woman that you are the message that you share mm -hmm. the adventures that you go on and i know that your heart speaks before you even open your mouth i do speak from the heart yeah you do <laughs> <I pretend it's laughs> you do but and you have this way of just helping people understand that it's not what happens to you that matters it's what you do with what happens to you and exactly you, you've yeah. proved that on naked and afraid you've proved that in your hospital stay with dengue fever you've proved that in migrations on the Serengeti and I know that you're going to continue to prove that over and over and over mm -hmm. and these children that are getting to work with you um, they're so fortunate you know to to be part of your camps and your training and your first aid and I, I would really strongly suggest anyone that's in the Los Angeles area if just go to manutoigo.com that's m-a-n-u-t-o-i-g-o.com and check out her classes. Even if you just want to go and observe her classes or watch what she's doing, you're going to take so much in. You're going to absorb the strength that is Manu, I believe. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And and it's not it's not just a, a basic survival skills. I, I've also started um, survival hikes up in Griffith Park. Mm -hmm. A lot of I see so many people hiking up there, and they're completely oblivious of what's going on around them and what's available. So, so this morning, in actual fact, I'm still dressed, still sticky. <laughs> but it was really awesome to take these kids off trail, right, onto very small remote trails. You'd be surprised what you find along those, all these different resources, uses for this or uses for that. This is what you can do here. This is how you would, you know, I mean, all these kind of things. But it's also uh, sharing stories, you know, like the, the kids always ask me, so what are, you know, questions about naked and afraid? And then they'll ask questions about migrations. Um, you know, one of the kids, uh, you know, I mean, just – he hadn't even heard of Naked and Afraid. And he was like, what? No clothes? Like, what would you do? You know, I mean, it's, it's just like their minds are just like blown away. Right. You know, just by that. And and see, when you see that in their eyes, they're like, what? Really? And, and then they just, they just explode out with all these questions. Right. But these questions, what they're listening to then is they're taking it in and it's being embodied in themselves and it's inspiring them. It's letting them know that these things are actually possible. Absolutely. You know, um, and, you know, and of course, uh, you know, getting sick, 
on uh, Naked and Afraid from the mosquito bite. Um, and then, of course, being hit by a warthog. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's like, of course, it would have to happen to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go again. Uh-oh. You know, there's my new toy guy. But then you've gone on to... <laughs> share that story and I mean it's like what can I say I can share what's happened to me but I didn't get hit by a warthog and I didn't get, <laughs> you know so what I love this is what I love about women coming together and we share our stories because it's not about who has the worst trauma who's experienced the worst event it's about sharing our stories it's about showing how we've overcome how we've come out on the other side and by each of us sharing what we know um, we are adding to the collective knowledge of women everywhere and we're just raising this vibrational energy and Manu I want to thank you so much for being on choices for women today sharing yeah. your story sharing your strength um, helping the audience know that whatever happens it can't be as bad as getting chased by a crocodile, right? Okay, so let's just say that if you're going through something, just keep telling yourself, it's not like being chased by a crocodile. And, or and, hit by a warthog. <laughs> or hit by a warthog. And for all of you listeners yeah. out there, if anything that Manu and I have said today has got you thinking, and you're thinking, hmm, how can I make some ch changes in my life? How can I move forward? How can I get out of victim mode. How can I make the changes that I want to make in my life? Please visit my website at nancymullerglobal.com. That's Nancy, N-A-N-C-Y, Muller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, global, G-L-O-B-A-L.com. Because I am always working on programs and um, products and opportunities, everything from like these free podcasts to self-help tools, to group coaching, to one-on-one -on -one coaching. I can meet you wherever you are because, ladies, it's so important for you to take that first step if you're ready, if you're ready. And I want you to know that there are people out there that really care about where you are and where you want to be. So if anything that we've said here today has got you thinking, please go to nancymullerglobal.com, start poking around, see what opportunities await you there, and then you can connect me, with me in any way that works for you. And I know you can go to manutoygo.com, see what she's up to, see what she's doing, see what she's offering. Because like me, and I know like Manu, we hope to hear you say, I love my life. Ciao for now. My life. Ha, <laughs>